What is up, guys? It is Stu, and it is another episode of the What the Fuck Gym Talk podcast. And I have Rich Diaz, who he doesn't prefer to be called a coach because that's uh, just like I did. I never wanted that. I don't want people thinking I fucking just had to stop watching my hand and and yell to people who are sweating. Uh, You're an advisor to high level performing athletes. You've got, you know, Hunter McIntyre under your, you know, you've worked with Ryan Fisher, um, uh, VJ Jones. I mean, anyone in the OCR space knows who you are. The high rock space knows who you are. I just went up there, looked at that event for the first time. I think it's got real potential for growth and everyone knew your name when I would mention your name. Like, oh yeah, Rich D, absolutely. But the CrossFit scene, I feel like has not been properly exposed to you mainly because, and this is not your fault. CrossFit does not allow popular concepts to infiltrate their ecosystem if you're not from within the ecosystem. They have outed a lot of people who Mark Ripito, uh, Kelly Starrett, some people who are subject matter experts in their fields, Brian McKenzie from the endurance world, if they didn't follow the CrossFit script. And you certainly don't follow the CrossFit script necessarily, which is one of the reasons I think there might have not been as much loud noise about it. But I've recently found you, Rich. I want to make some fucking noise about it. So anyway, I appreciate you coming on the podcast. I really appreciate it as well. Would you do everyone a favor? I've already done the intro as to who you are, but I what I want them to understand is your proprietary concept of flow and, and what essentially that means. Well, um, <clears throat> it's an interesting story, and I'm going to try to make it as brief as I can. Um I, uh, it started out with Hunter McIntyre and, you know, in the midst of me working with him and we, we got together on a regular basis, uh, pretty much weekly. I was coaching him during the, uh, OCR world championship, uh, approach. And, uh, and I was being introduced to a new sport. I was like, wow, this is kind of interesting. And, and I started thinking about the challenges that were associated with it and thinking in terms of the importance of developing the anaerobic system rather than just uh, worrying about aerobic all the time and i told him early on i said you know i'm going to write a i'm going to write a new book and it's going to be entitled training the dark side because to me the dark side is what occurs when you leave the anaerobic or the aerobic system let me real quick for anyone uh, listening they're thinking of ocr rich they're thinking of like these crazy spartan beasts they've heard of people shirtless in mud running up hills taking hours or hours or maybe multiple hours why are you thinking about anaerobic for something in which a lot of people might be thinking, but I thought that's just aerobic. You just got to be able to survive the race. Well, you can certainly survive the race aerobically, but if you want to win the race, you're probably going to need to go anaerobic. And so I'm not interested in training survivors. I train people to win. And uh, I've said that from the gate. I mean, if somebody calls me up and says they want me to coach them and they just want to survive an event, I say, you got the wrong guy. Is there a, from an energy systems perspective, is there something to be said where you are maybe aerobically or maybe even anaerobically running, and then you are interrupted by an obstacle in which relative body rate strength, you know, muscular endurance, things like that come into play that push you into an anaerobic threshold? Yeah. Well, so uh, again, uh, cutting back to, to the concept of the book, to me, when, when I, when I approached uh, high rocks, when I approached OCR, when I approached CrossFit, what I look at is the principal enemy in all of this is fatigue. What do we have to do to, to offset the potential for ensuing fatigue? And so I started looking metabolically what the cost of work is and what we can do to control that cost of work. And not much is given to the importance of anaerobic development. Everybody's thinking, you know, I'm going to lay in zone two. I'm going to be in zone two. Zone. Two. I, I'm so fed up hearing people talk about developing their zone two. And spending, you know, upwards of 10 or 15 uh, weeks exclusively staying aerobic, hoping to build an aerobic base only to find that if they're going to race, they're going to need to go into the anaerobic metabolism. And that becomes the next phase of their training. And I, I fell prey to it. I, I wrote this myself. I, my first book I wrote, I, I did the same thing everybody else did. Um, so it took me four years to write that little book. And the reason is because I just could not wrap my head around chasing other people's crap. It, and it's basically what a lot of authors do is they, you know, they they glean on to some concept of training that was written by maybe Lydiard 60 years ago. And they just kind of mimic those processes and they they slap it out there and people follow it. And ironically, people are still following that. But the advantage that I have is because I've been doing metabolic testing on athletes for close to 30 years. 
I've tested power athletes. I, I, I used to do all the preseason season diagnostics for the LA Kings, the hockey team. These guys are totally anaerobic. VO2 scores were really not that impressive. I mean, I think on average, these guys were pushing like 50. Um, and their thresholds weren't great. But their tolerance to this ensuing production of lactate was high. So they were, you know, imagine what this is. It's an interval-based work. So they're going in hard, and they're getting a break. They're going in hard, and they're getting a break. Um, so all these things started to come together. And uh, I started looking at, at uh, the, the challenge of CrossFit. And I thought, well, to me, if a guy's laying on the ground after f finishing a wad, you know, wallowing around in his sweat, um, it beat his ass, right? Uh, and I want to see a guy finish a workout, slap his hands, I'm done, I got it done next, right? And still achieve the same end. And that seems kind of uh, difficult to achieve, but just really getting into understanding how lactate production is such a big deal and what you can do to tame it, to get involved in the lactic acid system and cause it to be an asset rather than a liability. And, and essentially what, what I talk about, and I don't know anyone else in the, in the space that talks about this, but there's basically two primary metabolic transporters that are principally involved in what happens with that lactate under load. And for an endurance athlete, it's, uh, it's MCT1. And essentially, this is a pathway where the lactate is going to be repurposed. It's going to go off into some part of the body that is quiet and then find its way back into the liver and repurposed into glucose, glycogen, and back into the working muscles. And I refer to it as an energy rebate. You might gain back 30% 30, 30 of what you spent because you were effectively uh, working within that system. But you can't, you're not going to get that timeline and recovery timelines when you're going into high intensity work. That's a completely different transport system, which is MCT4. And what this stuff does is it basically gets the, the lactate out of the muscle as quickly as possible, but it is not going to be available to you as energy. But in a high intensity, short duration activity, you don't need that energy. What you need is to continue to march at that high intensity without being waylaid by, by the acidic nature of the lactate. And, and uh, I'm telling you, I, I don't know anybody that talks about this. It's, it's and, interesting. So, Real quick, I just want to point out one thing. So in the beginning, when you start talking about, it's all about, you know, battling fatigue, uh, which is essentially the, the subtitle of the book, uh, you know, training the dark side, the battle of fatigue. And you mentioned a lot of the people thinking z zone two, and I want to frame this up for the audience because a lot of maybe the audience kind of scratching their head there. The endurance community is well versed and overly versed and overly abuses the idea of zone two, right? We get into that 80 20 principle. You can talk about math 180, whatever it may be. The CrossFit community only recently, in the past like five or to seven years, has even been introduced to the concept of zone two. The CrossFit community had the opposite problem. All they did was just they just produce lactate all day like it was going up in stock. They they know how to produce lactate. They had no idea how to clear it and then how to sustain it. That's why at the CrossFit Games, those were the only humans doing CrossFit that expo that said that did exactly what you just described. They finish a grueling workout and they look stoic. They're yeah. not in they're not in a bath of lactate because they've learned how to, like you said, repurpose lactate, use it as a flu, flu, uh, f uh, fuel source, and move on. Whereas, unfortunately, the people do it going to the CrossFit Games represent 0.0001%. The other 99% are regular people in CrossFit gyms working out for one hour a day with jobs and kids, and they work at Bank of America and all that other shit. And all they do is just bathe in lactate every day. And that's where we get the adrenal fatigue and all that bullshit. So Z zone two work is still something relatively novel to see anyone get on a rower or a concept two bike at the end or beginning of class and just hit 30 minutes of Z2 is still, it's never, it's not, it's not very popular versus the endurance community, which you're referencing, trying to get those fuckers to put some speed and lay it down was probably really a hard sell for you. Well, so the, the, the thing that, that was the, the wake-up call for me was the nature of segregating the energy systems. You know, like you're either being aerobic or you're being anaerobic. And you don't have two energy systems. You have an energy system. And I want to see athletes um, build a relationship with the entire energy system. So there's going to be times, oftentimes, where you're going to need to drop the hammer and go hard 
And you need to be well-versed in that application. You can't always rely on this low intensity, I'll, I'll finish the race kind of mentality. And so the other consideration from a, a, a muscle structure and function consideration is that um, when you're constantly staying in the slow twitch fibers, you're losing the losing ground with the fast twitch fibers, right? And so when I started talking about these metabolic transporters, these MCT4 fibers only reside in fast twitch fibers. So if you're not doing something to develop that into the system, you're relying on the repurposing process. And that takes too long. Now, if you're going to go out for an hour, maybe a marathon, whatever, you've got time to process that lactate if the intensity is low enough. But in a high intensity effort, you don't have that time. So you got to learn to live in a much deeper intensity environment. And so what I've done, and I've done this with, you were mentioning Sam and some of these other guys, is I taught them to um, put a ceiling on the top end heart rate responses. And I use heart rate simply because it's a good indicator of stress. I mean, while you're training, you don't really have anything else that's going to tell you what you're doing, well, with the exception of uh, power output if you're on a particular machine, right? But when you're running uh, and or anything along those lines, you, you really can't rely on those kind of metrics. You need heart rate. So heart rate is going to tell you, okay, I'm at about 80% of my max effort right now, and I can't go beyond that because I get into trouble when I get beyond that. And then if I get into a situation where I allow myself to recovery on the bottom end, I start to rely on that recovery. So you never get past go because you're always depending on that recovery and you're always going too high into the intensity. And the, the too high intensity is going to uh, produce more lactate than you're able to clear. So I keep them governed within a range and they progressively flow, as you were referring to my book, in and out of that intensity. So I might fashion workouts where depending on what the end product is, uh, a level exposure to what part of the energy system, uh, but all aspects of the energy system is always in play. So you may, even with a, a marathon, you might have 20% uh, of the time you're, you're, you're uh, heavy into the lactate, maybe in 5% of the time uh, near VO2 max effort. And and that's where for anyone listening, it, and I know unless you, uh, and again, I cannot recommend anyone enough, go by the training the dark side, go by Rich's book, the visual component you've created, this infinity symbol, and then your icon model, where you have these icons laid out across this infinity symbol. Essentially, for those of you guys, uh, more visual learners, which maybe that's why you ended up doing it, Rich, because it's easy. Mm -hmm. This stuff gets so nerdy and jargon-like. I enjoy it right. as someone who you know, got a degree in exercise science. You enjoy it. But for the average person for application, we all like pictures and colors and icons. We could all wrap our head around that. Right. Um, it's this infinity symbol, guys, and it just shows start here do this for a period of time, do this for a period of time, then do this for a period of time where everything's talked about where maybe your heart rate should go in terms of the high end of your aerobic output versus going then eventually going into the lower to medium end of your anaerobic output, maybe dialing it back and focusing on your running gait and your technique and getting your 180 steps per minute uh, dialed in. And it just flows in and out of this. And I see that rich. And I'm like, why aren't more CrossFitters looking at this? Because that is the nature of an average CrossFit workout. The workout starts and they're aerobic for a period of time. They get into either the higher aerobic or even that anaerobic, but then they will instantly drop down. Either they come to an exercise that just isn't great at producing high RPMs, like a farmer's carry. You're not really going to get your heart rate too heavy grabbing those two kettlebells and walking at a, at a fast pace as opposed to the kipping pull-ups or the rowing sprints or the you know deadlifting. Burpee broad jumps. Yeah, <laughs> burpee broad jumps and high rocks, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. And so you watch this. I'm like, this is exactly how a CrossFit workout would flow naturally based on an average person's own limitations and strength. Sally can't do the pull-ups. She has to rest and stay. She has to stand there looking at the pull-up bar and wait 25 to 45 seconds for blood to get out of her biceps so she can jump back up there. That rest has created something like what you would prescribe in one of your flow cycles of, you know, reducing it down to the low aerobic state, you know, letting that heart rate recover. 
And uh, anyway, I was as I read through this, I just made so much sense. And my application of it, and we'll get into later. I'm not even. I don't do cross. I, I don't do CrossFit, but I'm like, God, why aren't more CrossFit coaches and gyms? And that's where I'm heavily immersed in that world. Why the fuck aren't they talking about this? Well, I think part of it is like anything. If you don't quite understand it, you can't wrap your head around it. You can't command it. Then you don't touch it. And that happens, you understand, where, I mean, I've I've been doing, like I said, I've been doing this work with all sorts of athletes for years and years and years, right? So, for example, I work with kids. I work with cross-country runners in, in the high school. And even trying to touch the concept of heart rate in training with with, with uh, a cross, um, cross-country runner. The coaches don't understand the work, so they're not going to talk about the work. You know, and they're, they're not going to solicit to the kids to buy a heart rate monitor and understand how to train because they don't really understand it anyway. And so, you know, taking it a step further where you're really starting to look at manipulating lactate production, uh, that gets a little heady for a lot of people. And if they're not 100% confident that it's going to go down, they're not going to do it. Now, if I took uh, one of the top athletes in the sport and got them to buy into it for a while and let them, you know, experience it and have them, you know, show that it, it worked for them, then you'll start people paying interest to it. They're going to start looking at it, right? Everybody wants to do what Mikey's doing, right? Sure. So it's it's kind of like that. And and I figure there's probably long beyond, beyond me, uh, it'll start to take hold and people will start talking about it. And they'll say that Richard Diaz dude, you know, who, who long past uh, was the guy that kind of brought this up. Um, and I'm okay with that. I, I just, I, I have patience with it. I, I know I've had athletes that have followed the the, the principles and have, tremendous success i mean crazy success and when i show i've got a, an athlete that a marathoner that you know went to boston he, he runs a 223 marathon and he followed a 20-week flow process that i wrote preparing for the boston marathon and his average uh heart rates dropped 30 beats per minute on uh and and his average pace was 520 uh for 20 miles uh, where his previous attempt at at Boston was 225, and his his heart rate was averaging 160 beats per minute, uh, and that means dying across the finish line to get 225. Where we were actually, had he not got sick, you know, they're just so unfortunate. He got sick. I predicted he was going to run a 217 after following the flow method, and the sickness kept him from doing that. Obviously, yeah, <laughs> kind of crazy, but. But uh, I mean, I had I captured the data. I've got his straw. I showed it to a hundred people, if not one, where you see these splits. You know, you get 15 miles into a into a a run, and your heart rate's 128 beats per minute, and you're running at a you know almost a five minute flat pace. You know, it was just absolutely crazy. And for anyone who's watching this over on YouTube, you're going to get the benefit of this next thing. I'm actually, if you're good with it, Rich, I'm actually going to pull up your flow cycle one to do a visual sure. and kind of walk people through it. If any of you guys are sure. listening to this on the podcast, don't fucking, don't go over to YouTube. Don't kill anybody while you're driving on the goddamn highway. Just wait till you get <laughs> home and then go watch this thing. But um, all right, Rich, you can see my screen? Yeah. Great. So guys, this is a uh, flow cycle one, essentially. And I'm going to go ahead and you see Rich has got the starting point here. So we'd start and then there'd be two minutes of essentially this is like motor develop motor skill development. Actually, that's Rich? cadence. Cadence. I'm that's... sorry. This would be cadence. And yeah. if you want to, uh, I notice a lot of people want to argue with them, uh, argue with you on this. I'm sold on it. Uh, 180 steps per minute is what you recommend as being the ideal cadence for pretty much any runner of height or weight. Well, it's physics. Yeah. It just draws your foot closer to your body when you make ground contact. And, and the closer to your body that you land, the more stable you are, more stable you are, more force you could produce. So yeah. what I, let, if I could just kind of walk you through this, if you yeah, like. Please, please do, Rich. So the first two minutes was just education. We're just going to kind of tune the violin. We're going to get on cadence. We're going to step it out and make sure that we're doing well. Motor skill development is taking the same premise, but this time we're starting to push the pace. We're trying to see if we can go faster without violating proper mechanics. And then the next icon is basically representing an icon and in, uh, excuse me, a time trial. And the time trial is just uh, because it's the first flow cycle. What we're trying to do is say relative to a particular pace or heart rate, um, what does what look, things look like today, right? So for example, uh, you could see it says one mile aerobic time trial. Uh, and I put an example of 10 minutes of completion just to make it make it uh, uh, easy for people to wrap their head around. But let's just say, for example, your, your aerobic threshold is about uh, 
125, 130 beats per minute. You run one mile. How long did it take to cover that mile? You record that information for later days. The big icon, which is the green, is now we're going into some lactate. So now let's, again, let's repurpose this to say we're going to say that the threshold was like one, anaerobic threshold was like 150 beats per minute. We're going to spend about two minutes at probably 155, 160. And then we're going to drop down to kind of high aerobic. So we're going to go down to like 150 beats per minute. And then for 30 seconds, we're going to punch it out. We're going to go close to VO2 max effort for 30 seconds. Then you can see that the smaller icons indicating low aerobic. So we're going down to say, uh, in this case, probably about 130 beats per minute for a couple minutes. And then we're going to pop up to say like 155 for a couple minutes. We're dropping back down to aerobic for another five minutes and then repeating what we did earlier at, for two minutes and then hitting that, that hard run again for 30 seconds. And so basically what we're doing is we're feathering in and out of the energy system. We're going to touch on some anaerobic metabolism. We're going to touch on some high intensity anaerobic metabolism. We're going to recover, clear some of that lactate, and just basically go through this. Now, what's interesting about this is that when you look at the timeline, there's a total of 50 minutes in the cycle. And in 50 minutes, 30 minutes of what of the contribution was aerobic, which included the time trial. 10 minutes were anaerobic, and 10 minutes were dedicated to skill work. The skill work being the first four minutes of the work. Now, a, traditionally, what someone might do with this is they might spend the first five weeks just staying aerobic, 10 weeks staying aerobic, and then start to go off into the lactate and try to develop the capacity to survive in that environment. The problem being is that you're basically trading your, your adaptation for more of an aerobic to more of an anaerobic effort. So you basically wasted the first 10 weeks of training. So these cycles were depicted in greater and greater depth, longer durations, shorter durations, higher intensities, all through the concept of flow. And that right there, if for everyone listening, if you fall in line with CrossFit, remember what Greg Glassman did is he essentially looked at the world of fitness. People would go into the gym. This is the <clears> post <throat> gold gym era, that type of scenario. They go into the gym, they lift weights. And then they'd go and get on elliptical for 20, 30 minutes. Fitness was segregated. Cardio and strength was segregated. Right. And essentially what Greg created was an intra-session concurrent training model, right? Where right. within the same session, you have resistance training and you have conditioning. And right. what you know Rich has done here is essentially taken – and I, I now I'm not an endurance athlete. Uh, I let, in October of last year, um, one of my business partners, a good friend of mine, passed away, and I decided to run the Chicago Marathon in three hours or less in his name. And I'm not a runner, Rich, um, and I'm well okay. on my way. I just completed the Austin half marathon in 129. Um, nice. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, and I've got, you know, I've got another six months. So I'm well on my way. Uh, and hopefully, after coming down and seeing you in Franklin, I'll be, I'll be even closer. But right. this is, um, I, you know, as I'm looking at this, I'm like, Rich has got here essentially. Interesting. When we talk about concurrent training, we're always talking strength and conditioning. I almost look at this as concurrent training in aerobic and anaerobic, and it's intercession. Whereas my traditional endurance, you know, research prior to finding you would be like Mondays we're doing a, a long run, Tuesdays is a tempo, Wednesdays is fast track work. Very similar to CrossFitters. I'm going to go into the gym and I'm going to lift heavy, and then I'm going to do a wad. Well, uh, my brain was always why separate the two? Why not? Do your heavy lifting within the wad. Well, I can lift heavier if I'm not taxed. Well, last time I checked, fucker, you're going to be taxed in every workout you do. <laughs> Wouldn't you want to create the capacity to do so within that realm? And that's where this, I was just like, if I can get this in front of more CrossFitters that didn't get a chance to see all the, when you and Ryan Fisher are really making a big deal about this. And again, I think it was COVID and distractions and all that. Right. I, I really think a lot of people just sink their teeth into it. So let's take it a step further. Uh, this model is just kind of a generic first time around. Let's get introduced to it. Uh, some of the more in intense workouts might begin with a high level of intensity at the gate. So I, what I know about CrossFit, and which is very little, quite frankly, is that you really don't know what's going to happen at the games until you get to the games, right? So they may decide to hit you with something really hard and intense early. Yeah. Yeah. And if you were trying to prepare yourself in such a way that um, you you were developing your aerobic potential early on, and then you know later on is when after you've warmed up and prepared, you can get into more intensity. Um, you're going to be uh, ill-equipped 
It's the same thing with uh, racing. You know, I, I coach athletes all over the world. And if you're not able to respond to whatever your competition throws at you right out of the gate, uh, let's say somebody takes you into deep water right away, um, that can be a serious problem for you. You can't respond to it. You get on, you know, over your head and then you got a problem. No, yeah, you can see now I'm, I'm introducing some of the uh, sustained components. Yeah, so you know? this is then I break in the high rocks, which I just yeah. recently discovered about a little over a month ago, right around the same time as you. And then I look at this, I'm like, okay, if a CrossFitter can visually see this, because I think they see the other one and they just think runner, endurance, yeah. endurance. The, you know, they got to see a fucking metal barbell, you know, iron barbell to feel <laughs> yeah. anything. So, but in here, very similar, Rich, right? This is essentially taking someone through these aerobic bouts, primarily, especially for high rock specifically, this is going to be running due to the one kilometer, eight different times over. They have to do that. Right. Yeah. Right. Is, well, to be honest with you, I, I, I'm rewriting this book. Okay. Uh, it's because I've been coaching a lot. Uh, now I have about 60% of my athletes that I coach are high rocks athletes. Uh, if you asked me eight months ago, I'd say 80% of my athletes were uh, OCR athletes uh, with a sprinkling of triathletes and marathoners in there. But now high rocks has gotten to be very popular. And you er early said that you felt that this thing's going to gain legs. And I agree with you. I think this is going to be the sport of, uh, of the, of the century. I mean, it's going to be. Can I ask why you think that I, I've got my thoughts, but I'm very curious from your perspective. Well, because it's so, um, it's so easy to adopt, okay? So like, for example, I work with OCR athletes that might live in Florida and they're trying to prepare for an event that's gonna put them on a mountain and have to climb to 10,000 feet. That mountain's not available to them often, right? Being able to, to go into a gym and touch everything you need to touch in order to compete makes it easier. The running component takes it a little further away from a CrossFit mentality. And, uh, and, and incidentally, I believe that in this sport, running is principally important because this is where you're going to lose most of your lactate uh, or produce the most amount of lactate. And if you go into an exercise that's going to require strength after you're really lit up from the run, you got a problem. So uh, I spend a lot of time focusing on running. That's kind of what people want to refer to me as the running guy. Uh, I don't, I kind of have pushback towards that, but um I, I see the importance of being able to run well and efficiently and economically and able to carry game to the to the exercises. And this is very much in keeping with the same premise that was was going down with the CrossFit workouts. Uh, so I don't know. I just think uh, already that I've noticed a lot of people moving that way. I think there's probably some issues with, with the the uh, the event promoters that you know they don't seem to have their game tight um they're you know guys that are trying to make a living in the sport are having a lot of trouble on the they ocr side on, well they can't depend on getting paid on time sure um, you know they keep changing the amount of money they're going to pay for things and and then they're losing sponsors and you, you know i predicted early on when i was working with hunter that the sport was the ocr sport was going to turn into a multi-million dollar uh, adventure where you know a guy can train up and, and make a living like uh you know being in the nba or something but obviously that didn't happen. Yeah. These obscure sports, it, you know, I, uh, when I went up, when I've got to see my first high rocks event up in Chicago about a month ago, uh, I spent a lot of time with Mo Fuerste, who's the co-founder. We talked the business side of this and here's something that I, that I really observed M marathon is more running is the number one fitness modality used in the world bar none. More people run than CrossFit and basketball and football and everything combined. Okay. Right. And the marathon, it, there's about, uh, I forget the number I, I, I looked up. It was, you know, however many millions of people sign up for a marathon every year. The marathon, though, allows you to participate in the same event as Kachobi, the elites. But right. you don't get to spectate and enjoy watching and kind of fanboy over your favorite athletes because, right. well, you're running that thing. You're just way fucking behind them. You don't get to enjoy right. that part. Now, the CrossFit Games, the CrossFit Games, you have to be the elite to participate. So a right. regular person like you and me, Rich, if we meet up to go watch the CrossFit Games, we can only send the stands and drink a beer and watch. We can't actually right. participate with them. Whereas High Rocks allows you via the way they do the heats, they allow you to participate in the same event as the elites, and then they separate those elite heats and then allow you to spectate. And now you have fanboys of Hunter McIntyre and Ryan Kent and all right. these guys. So I think just even that basic 
concept of being able to participate and spectate creates something. It keeps them in the fucking convention center. I was there rich for 10 plus hours. The amount of people that are in there buying drinks and apparel and hanging out because they ran the race and then they stuck around to watch the elites. Oh my, I think it's, you know, there's no weather complications. It's uh, yeah, it's just smart business in my opinion. That's the only sport, the only sport, endurance sport I've ever seen where actually they were serving liquor at a bar. I, oh, I was my favorite part. <laughs> it was my favorite part. Um, but so I want to ask you about a few things on this, Rich. And, you know, again, guys, if you were, had the benefit of watching this, these visuals, when you really get into the book, it, it's so interesting the way he's got all of this laid out. But I want to I want to ask you some stuff that a lot of coaches uh, I, I was on Instagram posting that I was going to be talking with you and people were hitting me up with questions. There's a lot of, I think, a mis perceived concept from young green coaches where they look at things like aerobic and anaerobic and they think of these things as kind of light switches where you just instantly transition yeah. uh, and i use my own data so i just mentioned i did that uh the austin half marathon and my my numbers on there is i i held a heart rate of 163 was my average heart rate i punched the last you know uh, almost the last mile more aggressively and i got up to 177 now if I told someone is a heart rate of, you know, I'm two, I'm uh, 37 years old. I'm 205 plus pounds. If I said a heart rate of 163, someone would be like, well, that's definitely anaerobic. Your, re your uh, respiratory exchange ratio is definitely 1.0 or greater at that point. You are using primarily carbohydrate. But then how does he do that for over an hour? And my thing is that just because you're anaerobic doesn't mean you can't do it sustainably. I might not be able to do that for three hours. We'll find out in Chicago. But it, just because you're in an anaerobic heart rate zone or whatever your model of where you believe your heart rate zones are doesn't mean you can't sustain it. It just would mean, and correct me if I'm wrong, that individual has done a better job of using lactate that is being produced as a fuel source, as an energy rebate, as Rich Diaz would put it. Absolutely. So let, let me share with you that conceptually what my role in all of this is, I'm a fly on the wall. You know, don't look at me and say, well, how come you're, you know, this old man, you can't run, you, you know, you're overweight, you know, why should I listen to you, right? Well, I've been the fly on the wall for close to 30 years. I, I've done diagnostics on, I can't even tell you how many thousands of athletes from all fashion of sport, professional to recreational to near death, right? And uh, so I'm, a, I'm an observer. I'm just a trained observer. I see the data. I look at it. I learn from it. And I move on. So I'm going to paint a picture for you. <clears throat> My best um, model to explain this is Hunter McIntyre. And he'll forgive me for using him in this conversation because uh, he uses it in his conversations with others when he's training people. Um when I started working with Hunter McIntyre early on, he was, a, I don't know, probably a 210 pound, six foot two, uh, fairly muscular, you know, strong individual, right? His his VO2 score was about, uh, at peak was just shy of 70, about 68, 69 was his VO2 score. And his threshold was about, well, at about 160 beats per minute, he was 66% uh, into his fat stores. So clearly... The, the dominant influence from the energy system is from aerobic metabolism. So look, we're going to call them aerobic. I don't like to talk about zones. I don't like to talk about thresholds. But because of the respiratory exchange ratio telling me he's 66% fat utilization, I would get on a bike next to him knowing this and say, we're going to go, we're not going to exceed 160 beats per minute. We're not going to drop below 155. We're going to run a half marathon. And I'm going to be right there with you watching his heart rate and his pace he would run uh just below a six minute pace for 13 miles and be singing in the rain be totally fine so for his size that was quite an amazing feat so he delves off into crossfit he makes it into the games high intensity training running just kind of fell behind for the most part and really soliciting to fast switch fibers and just pounding himself into the ground right uh, do another VO2 during CrossFit, his threshold dropped considerably uh, and his, his VO2 score also dropped considerably. Now he's the High Rocks world champion. Test him again. His threshold now is 130 beats per minute. Now he's about um, 
80% into his uh, sugar stores at that heart rate. And his VO2 score drops down to like 58. So wait, let's just recap that. So his threshold of uh, his heart rate has dropped, but he's using more carbohydrates at that point. Exactly right. So now he's soliciting to about 70, 80% carbohydrate as opposed to 30 beats higher than that would have been um, uh, double that from fat utilization. Can we just so clarify, at, will you clarify the, how, why aerobic and fat, just real quick, aerobic. Okay, so yeah. fat burns in the presence of oxygen. That's a principal concern, right? If you're trying to figure out, am I aerobic or not? If fat is your principal energy source, you're definitely aerobic. When carbohydrate becomes your principal energy source, you're anaerobic, okay? So now what, what he's exhibiting to me in the test is he's more anaerobic than he's ever been. And he looked at it like failure. He goes... I am, I am more fit than I have ever been in my life. And I said to him, I said, listen, you got to stop worrying about this because you've taught yourself to live in this anaerobic environment. You're, you're, you're dealing with this toxicity better than all the competition you're, you're dealing with. And it's all good. I said, just don't stop doing what you're doing and don't go into another sport. Just stay right here. <clears throat> because if you start going back towards aerobic uh, sports, and you're going to have to retrain your body to adapt to that new stimulus. It's so incredible. He, had three it, per, he almost <clears throat> had like three lives, essentially. <clears throat> like you, you just listed three different metabolic profiles for him. And within, you know, in probably I'm assuming less than a decade, let, you know, several years yeah, type sure. scenario, because he switched those pretty quick. And and he's saying the third one, the last one, is where he feels the fittest. He's aged the most. And we all know as you age, and he's nowhere close to 40 years old, but your VO2 max drops, all this other shit. That's uh, that's incredible. Well, so now, <clears throat> you, you know this guy. And most people that hear this know something of him. And I'm getting the inside scoop, right? So he'll call me up and say, look, I'm going to the games. If I get in the games, as soon as I finish the games, I'm going back to Spartan. I'm going to try to win the OCR World Championships or the Spartan World Championships, which means he's going to go to Lake Tahoe and it's a 10,000 foot elevation gain uh, for a, a, a beast distance event, which is 13 miles on a mountain. And so he needs to flip the switch. He's got to go from this anaerobic environment that he's been training in and living in to completely aerobic to climb up this mountain and be successful as a big guy, right? I said, that's that's crazy. I said, you're looking at, we got we got nine weeks. I said, you want me to turn you into this other machine from this polar opposite machine in nine weeks? I said, you're out of your mind. It's not going to work. He goes, yeah, well, it'll be a great story if I can do it, right? I said, well, hey, okay, I'm in. Uh, you know, let's give it a shot. <laughs> but I mean, he was dancing with the devil. He was always trying to push these, these envelopes. And, you know, despite my pushback, with him conversationally about what a ridiculous proposition it is to try to do this one thing and go completely do this other thing in such a short timeline. But, you know, I have to give it to him. He, he was very successful at, at that approach. Do I recommend it to others? Probably not. Uh, but I mean, if you came to me and said, look, I, you, you've professed that you're going to run a marathon. My process for you to run that marathon would be completely different than I would have you do trying to compete in a high rocks event, right? It's just a different animal altogether. And, uh, and I would need time. So like, if you went and ran that marathon, then you said you wanted to become a high rocks athlete. Um, then we would shift gears and we start working towards the higher intensity dealing in this lactate and whatever. Um, and you know, the strength component is big. And we go after those skill bases and, and we, we would, we could do it, but don't ask me to do it in two weeks. It's going to, it's going to take time. Right. Um, so basically that's it. So what I'm trying to suggest to you, and this is the thing that's frustrating for me. And when you talk about these long, young coaches coming up, they're all bent on this zone two low intensity being such a principal component of their fitness. Well, they're trying to put one, one shoe on everybody's foot. Right. And it just isn't the wisest approach if I was to put it without getting weird. Right. Yeah. Just because specificity is a thing. Right. Well, yeah. you're, you know, and again, uh, I told you as my thing is fatigue. What is this causing fatigue and what do we need to do to combat fatigue? And it's, it's got to do with the level of intensity, 
It's got to do with the duration of effort. It's got to do with the sustainability, muscular endurance, uh, mus muscular power. All these things come into play. And if you start wasting your time in areas that aren't going to pay the rent, it's just not going to make as much sense as you'd hope it might. There's a gentleman, and um, I think we get along with when I when I decided to go about this very untraditional way of training for the marathon. I uh, I got booked a consulting call with him. His name is Chris Henshaw. So I know who the, he is. Okay, so I and I you guys I think we get along, and I, I don't know if you guys have ever met in person or being familiar. He is so big into looking at the CrossFit athlete, and not necessarily not prescribing the zone two as much as you're big and powerful. Right. These guys that can deadlift and squat and clean and jerk. And I'll be like, you guys just need to learn how to clear lactate. Like you have got to get your body primed because all you do is produce it for these short bouts. But the CrossFit Games is five, six days long. You've got to get better at clearing it. And that was the first time I had been exposed to the concept of uh, I'm more of a power strength athlete anyway. And, you know, creating workout scenarios where I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to do what my body does well. Bigger, powerful athletes can create lactate pretty damn quickly. We can't clear it as well. So we have to put ourselves in a position to create that lactate and then clear it. So, you know, maybe you're going to push a, a light to moderately loaded sled as fast as you can until it's just coursing through your veins like battery acid and then force yourself to go into slow tempo-based squats or lunges or something similar and get your muscles comfortable with using it as fuel and not allowing it to just crush you in a workout. No, And then, you know, I hear that from him and I hear everything you're talking on fatigue. Like you, you I feel like you're written the book on fatigue and lactate. I think, I think the two of you on that note, especially, I'm not sure how your coaching philosophies would differ otherwise i believe you guys are very much on the same page there well i think the the if there's going to be a distinction i think the distinction would lie in the fact that the the duration of recovery in most training systems that i've seen for these type of workouts and i'm kind of putting crossfit and uh high rocks in the same can is people are relying too much on lots of recovery because when you compete, you're not going to get it. So you got to teach your body to live underwater, basically. And so if you keep coming, it's a stupid analogy, but I'm, I'm going there anyway, right? So let's just say that you're trying to develop your capacity to swim underwater, right? So you keep getting up and getting a gulp of air, and you keep relying on that gulp of air, where longer duration under that toxicity is important. You have to start allowing yourself, but uh, progressively allow yourself to be in that toxic environment. So if you just go ham every time you're in the intensity component, you start pushing beyond your ability to, I mean, the, the lactate production exceeds your ability to get into a place where you can effectively clear it. And so if you allow yourself too, too much recovery, then your body starts to rely on that recovery in order to clear it. So you need to you need to shorten up the the recovery, and shorten up the intensity, and live in this window for a while, and then progressively keep tabs on it. So let's just say, for example, in in a, we'll just call it a wad for a lack of a better term. Let's just say in the component of the wad you have these um, like a concept two rower or or a ski or or even an exercise bike uh, where. You're going to, uh, traditionally, you would allow yourself to recover too much, and the intensity when you get back to it is too high. So you're 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 not really getting your you're, you're not really going to teach your body how to to fend it off. Now let's just say that hypothetically that I say I want you to, let's give you a window. Let's just say I want you in your case, based on what you told me, I don't want you to go past 165. I don't want you to recover below 145. Okay. That's your that's your window. So and when, so it, when I hit 145, say, I, I if I'm at 145, my ass better be moving on to the next thing. You're going right back into game. So let's just say that the point from 160 to 145, let's just say hypothetically takes a minute. Okay. With time doing the same thing, you start noticing that your recovery shortens up to 30 seconds. So we got a couple of things we can do. We can shorten up the recovery a little bit more, or we can allow more intensity in the top end because there's adaptation. So what you're starting to show me is adaptation. 
And the way to determine that ad adaptation is how those limiters are, are being affected. So I could take on more intensity. I may even be able to take on more intensity and take on less recovery, which is what you want, right? You want to be able to get to a place where you don't need as much recovery and you can put on more work and still get through it. And so this is an adaptation that occurs metabolically. Your body gets better at not, not repurposing the lactate. You don't want to repurpose lactate in, in an hour event. What you want to do is get rid of it. You just want it to go away from that muscle so it can continue to march. And so this is where if you allow too much recovery, now, now you start to look for this potential to repurpose. And it, it, you don't need that. What you need to do is you, you just got to be clean. You need to clear it. Um, and so this is kind of as simple as it might seem. This is where most people miss it. They're either doing too much recovery, too much low end intensity, and or too much high end intensity and not having control over the, the high and lows of the work. I uh, had, I'll go, no, I'll finish. I'll just, well, but that's it. I mean, it's, I mean, at the end of the day, you can hang up on me because I just told you what you, what you need to do. <laughs> I, uh, I was thinking as you were saying that last sentence, I've had a lot of my friends that are tr in the traditional endurance community, Ironmans, triathlons, uh, and marathons. And I, I'm, you know, I've been, uh, trying to articulate your concept to them and it is an educate as, as as much of a layman's way as possible so I don't bore them with jargon and I, I I get met with well if I'm running a marathon my goal would be like to hit my target heart rate pace and just kind of maintain that for whatever it is I'm going to run at race pace and I have never known anything else so I've never ran an organized race I ran a 5k as the first test of this experiment of mine um then I just did the half marathon and then I'll do the Chicago full marathon and those are the only three races I've ever ran I noticed in my second race people that's not how the race is now take hills and shit out of it right there's you know terrain and hills and all that but even there were moments in the race for these endurance athletes you you know the water section the water uh, cooler section where people are handing you cups you move over to the far right you got to kind of wiggle your way in there you get a cup you down it and then you got to catch back up to if you're following a pacer that was i guarantee you if i had a heart rate monitor on them i was watching these guys their chest i was staring at their chest where they were next to me and i would see how much harder they were breathing after that quick exit, get some water and try to catch back up to where they were or guys who listen to music. And I swear to God, it'd be so fucking loud, Rich. I could be next to them and I could tell when a song they're really motivated on, I'd see a guy's chest just start raising a little bit more from the excitement, maybe of his favorite fucking song, just rocking on during the thing. And that's, you know, that's how I was talking to the endurance, my endurance buddies. I'm like, but that's the thing is in a race, you're never going to have this beautiful, straight streamlined scenario. It'll be more streamlined than CrossFit or High Rocks. But how would you, again, make it an argument for flow for someone who's like, well, I don't think I'm going to find myself in anaerobic bouts six different times throughout my race? Well, so here's here's what happens. Realize training is not the same as racing. So during training, what we're trying to do is we're trying to stimulate the entire energy system. We're trying to make friends with all that we own. I want to be able to handle it when I go hard. I want to be able to handle it when I want to just be steady state at a lower intensity. I want it all. I don't want, I don't want to be really good at one thing and not very good at the other. So um, having a robust energy system. So in other words, you're, you're keen. Everything's working for you, right? Then you go into a race, you develop a strategy. Uh, and what I, we haven't talked about that I think is extremely important in all of this is perceptive effort. I have people that will be a slave to their heart rate monitor when they're training or running. And so their heart rate's telling them something that doesn't seem to mesh up with the way they feel. I feel really good. My heart rate's telling me I'm like through the roof. Or uh, I feel like shit and my heart rate's really kind of low. Well, you have no relationship with your energy system perceptively. So what I tell people to do, and you, all through that book, I've said it over and over and over again, is don't just follow these dots and script. I want you to flow. I want you to, let's just uh, hypothetically say, you get ready to go for a run. You go out and intuitively you want to warm up. You want to get everything just humming. You're feeling good. And the way I structured it, a little bit of skill-based stuff, just making sure everything's good. Then you bust out and you, you say, you know what? I'm I'm ready to move. And you decide to dial it up. So you're not even looking at your monitor. You dial it up and say, you know what? I'm feeling pretty good. This is sustainable, but I think I have a little bit more. Maybe I push a little bit more. And then you say, you know what? I need to back out of this. I got to back down. 
So you back down, you recover a little bit. You say, you know what? I'm ready to go again. So essentially what you're doing is you're flowing through your energy system and you're starting to see the outcome is that um, you're getting better. So let's just say, let's throw heart rate back into it. Let's just say the first time you push, you hit 160 beats per minute and your pace just hypothetically is eight minute pace. And then through the course of your little flow action, when you come back at it, you notice that, wow, the second time I came at it, my pace is now 730. But I don't feel any worse for wear. Matter of fact, I feel I could stay here longer. And you do. Or maybe you feel like, you know what, at this pace, I can go a little faster. And you'll start to notice that your body starts to heave, heave too. It starts to uh, requiesce to the way you're, you're approaching the work. And you'll start noticing you dig into more effort or make more capacity than you than you were being structurally uh, confined by. And so my athletes, when they're racing, I don't want them to look at their monitor. I want them to wear it because I want to see the metrics later, but I don't want them to look at it. I want them to deal with perception because especially in a race, when that gun goes off, your heart rate's going to roll at about 15 to 20 beats higher than your perceptive effort's going to be. And if you look down at it, you're going to slow down. You just screwed yourself. Because you could have probably been okay at that particular level of intensity. So getting back to, you know, flowing and whatever, and you want to be kind of steady state. This is what I do with time trials. So uh, time trials will go up in a marathon. I'll have up to a 20 mile time trial and you'll probably do it three times in a 20 week build. The first one is steady state. We're going to stay right at this aerobic window just to see what it feels like. Because the first thing you need to do in a marathon is finish it, Right. And if you can't finish it aerobically, you certainly can't finish it if you put the hammer down somewhere along the way. So I want to see, okay, what does it look like? What did I feel like? Where was my feeding strategy come into play? And then the next time we try it, we're going to put the hammer down here and there and just see what it feels like if we put it uh, push. Where could we push? Where should we have pushed and learn from it? And then the third time we do it, it's like dress rehearsal. We're going to like make it like a race. And just see what it comes up. And by the time you get to actually doing the race, your strategy will be in play. Your perceptive effort will be, to, to for the most part, leading you through this process. And the heart rate throughout training was just to guide you. It wasn't, it wasn't the be all, must be kind of thing. It was just a guide. Now, I want to know, when I test people, I find out where they are energetically relative to heart rate. Okay, when you're at this heart rate, this is what your, your your caloric demand is, and this is where the calories are coming from. And is this sustainable? No, you can't. You're burning way too many calories from carbohydrate at this point. Odds are you probably won't make it. Unless maybe you're repurposing that lactate and you're getting that energy rebate and it's helping you. I've had guys do, uh, I've had guys do like a, an OCR beast, you know, kill, uh, uh, Killian, I guess it's in Vermont. Um steep mountain climb, a beast, 32 miles of mountain running, and threshold be 120 beats per minute. The whole time they were racing, they were at like 160. How do you explain that? How do you stay out there for, you know, five, six hours, and you're 40 beats above your threshold, which means you're exclusively into your sugar stores, and you feel great? Because they've trained for it. This is some... This is somebody that's just really good at repurposing that lactate and they survive it. Incidentally, we talked about this and I'm just going to recap. Hunter races high rocks and he's at about 170 beats per minute. His threshold these days is about 40 beats below that. How does that happen? You know, if you were to try to look at it metabolically, somebody said, no, oh, you can't do that. It won't work. You ever done a spinning class? Yes. The founder of spinning is a guy by the name of Johnny G, Johnny Goldberg. Johnny was one of my clients. Johnny developed that program by preparing to do the race across America. And so he's a cyclist, South African cyclist. He won the, the West Coast qualifier for Ram. Incredible distance he covered in 24 hours, right? I tested him. His threshold is 140 beats per minute. He goes, he goes, dude, he goes, I'm going to be out there for another 10 hours at about 20 beats above that. How do you explain that? The first physiologist that tested him told him it was impossible. And he said, I, I don't even want to talk to that guy anymore. 
He goes, the guy has no idea what he's talking about. And I told him, I said, you've probably got the most innate capacity to use lactate as a fuel source of anybody I've ever met. And that, that resonated with him. He could see, okay, now I get it. He could stay at the sustainable effort. He's repurposing that lactate. He's clearing it. His body's doing what he's got to do to get the energy it needs to, to, to create the work he's doing. Obviously he's feeding, but you can't, you can't outfeed the effort, right? You can't eat enough to, to succumb to or, or overpower the amount of caloric expense you have, right? And you know, you talked about Iron Man. Iron Man is kind of the same thing. The, the value of, of Iron Man competition, by the way, I produced and directed the first professional triathlon for CBS Sports on the island of Kauai in 1984. Triathlon was my jam, right? Some of the best athletes in the world competed in my events. Not some, the best athletes in the world competed in my events. So I'm I'm keen on what they're going to do and what they need to do. I, I coach athletes that are doing Ironman. The value of being on that bike for six hours at a time, five hours on these long duration workouts, they start dipping in. Not, they're not laying down there, just laying down this like zone two effort on the bike the whole time. They'll get out there, especially when they're racing, especially if they're hoping to win. These guys are holding an average of close to 30 miles an hour for four hours. You're not going to tell me they're aerobic. There's no way that they're aerobic. And by the time they get off that bike, due to the feeding and the, the process of sparing uh, carbohydrate and or using a carbohydrate as a fuel source, um, they managed to run a, a, you know, a 240 marathon. So um, it all comes down to the lactate. It, I mean, I mean, there are other factors, right? But if you start studying it, if you really start digging through it and start looking for information about the the, the rationale for fatigue, what, what causes us to blow up? The number one on the list is always going to be lactate. They're going to tell you, well, when you get acidic, you shut down. That's why it's been so intriguing to me. And, and me as well. And obviously coming from this cross background and then into to what I do now with this tempo training and simultaneously uh, training for this marathon, again, so much of uh, of your work is it just made sense to me as which got me excited. I before the uh, conversation, I threw up uh, on Instagram, you know, if anyone has questions and a couple people hit me up with some questions. Um, are we are you good to keep going? I know we're kind of going over our time. Yeah, no, here. we're fine. We're great. Fine. Awesome. Um, so one question here is the evolution of marathon training. So I've looked back at, at the physiques of, you know, probably around the time when you were doing triathlons and things like that, it looked like the men specifically carried a little bit more muscular frames back in the seventies in the early days of these endurance events. And we've kind of really gone down, uh, in the, you know, I think the big thing where CrossFit really got, uh, you know, uh, CrossFit was so much anti LSD, long, slow distance, because then you're going to look like a fucking anemic, skinny Ethiopian running. You don't want that physique type scenario. So that's why long distance isn't great. But I, as I look now, there's this big push in this concept, and I'm sure you might have bumped into it on the internet of the hybrid athlete, right? You have guys like Nick Bear and all these athletes that are doing these strength feats. Alex Viata is a great example of that with strength feats, you know, deadlifting 700 pounds. And then simultaneously being able to go out and complete a triathlon or these people that are running sub five minute miles, but having 500 pound back squats in the same day, this hybrid concept. Do you think the evolution of marathon training is going to start moving more towards something like what you're prescribing or even something more intercession? I think the biggest thing in the endurance community has been getting them to do strength training. I think they looked at it as either a waste of time. They could be on the bike or on the road. Um, they don't want to get big and bulky and weigh themselves down. But I start looking at it like when I get endurance people to work out with me, the only way I can get them to lift weights, Rich, is if I write up an intercession workout where we're going to do 20, 30 minutes of resistance training, then we're out on a run for 20, 30 minutes. Then we're coming back in for 20, 30 minutes of resistance training, immediately back out on a run. If they get that, I can sell them on it. But if I told them to go to the gym and do four sets of 12 on the fucking bench press, they'd tell me to get lost. That's not how their brain thinks. So how do you see the evolution of marathon and endurance training as more people start integrating strength work? Well, first of all, as you were laying this out for me, the first thing that was coming to my mind, my, my retort would have been, uh, 
if you're going to have a bigger body, you're not going to win a marathon. I mean, so let's just start there. Uh, because the other factor that comes about with this mass is heat production. And I've seen uh, clinical studies where they looked at elite marathoners and they basically concluded that it, it was almost physiologically impossible to win a marathon. Um, when I say win, let's go to, let's give you a timeline to get under, say, a 210 marathon pace. Uh, unless you were uh, under 138 pounds, and, and do exclusively do exclusively to the heat production. So um, again, you know, I hate to keep using it as an analogy, but he, he threw it at me, and it's kind of what you're talking about—a hybrid athlete. Hunter comes at me and says, "I want to run the fastest marathon of a guy over 200 pounds. I want to get on the Guinness Book of World Records by, you know, running faster than anybody in the world." Um, in a marathon at this weight. So he goes, would you start looking for it? See, see if you could find the biggest guy and the fastest time. I found a guy, and I, I believe it to be true. There's a guy in Florida, he's six foot six, 219 pounds. And I think he ran like a 220 something marathon. And I shared that with Hunter and he was like, no, no way. He didn't do this. <laughs> it kind of, it kind of pissed on his parade because he he's thinking, oh shit, now I got to run sub 220 in order for them to make, make this work. <clears throat> um, but it, obviously the bigger you are, the harder it is to, to actually excel. So getting back to the concept of a hybrid athlete, if can, can you end up being fit? And so that's an interesting term too. Fit meaning that able to leap tall buildings in a single bound <laughs> faster than a, you know, a, a locomotive. This is Superman, right? Having all ends of the spectrum covered. And this is kind of what everybody, this holy grail of fitness is. I want to be able to do all this stuff. I want to be stronger than everybody else. I want to be faster than everybody else. I want to be able to endure more than anybody else. And it just physiologically is a monster challenge. You know, the, the adaptations that are required to excel from one end of the spectrum to the other are too demanding to allow both end of the spectrums to meet. Does that make any sense? No, it, it, it hundred percent does. I actually, mm -hmm. one of my favorite things that CrossFit I think did was they gave the opera, the first operational definition of fitness, which is work capacity across broad time and modal domains. Yeah. And I feel that's a very fitting definition of it. Now, what I think we've found though, is yes, I think if you want to run a sub a two hour and 10 minute marathon, like you want to be Kachobi, you want to be the best, the best of the world. I don't think that's possible in this hybrid concept. But I I what I think what my belief is my hope is we'll start seeing the edge get pushed of people being able to reach, you know, for someone hunter's size, right? And you know, or that other guy to get sub three right now is still a fuck. It's still pretty impressive to get, you know, to get 330, to get, you know, three flat. And I think we just start slowly seeing this evolution, not only because we have better technology. I think one of the reasons Rich Diaz is able to do the amazing things he has now is because if you were stuck back in the sixties, you wouldn't have all these fucking cool tools. I think like yeah. the knowledge and all the things we're doing now, mm -hmm. I hope we'd start moving in that line. Um, in that regard, I, and I know kind of where this person was going with the question on the marathon training um, is, you know, do you see when people come to you in these primarily endurance sports is strength a secondary auxiliary thing? Or is it something that everyone's kind of thinking of? And, they, and if they do do it, is it mainly from an injury prevention standpoint? Well, so it's it's kind of an interesting question in one regard, because I tell people constantly, um, especially where running mechanics are concerned, is that strength to weight ratio matters, right? The stronger you are relative to your, your height and weight, uh, the more resilient your body is across the board. So I'll see people that have just terrible mechanics and perform really well. And they, you know, the old adage, you know, leave well enough alone. That I'm doing really, really well. Don't bother me about my mechanics because it, it's, you know, I'm good. And I look at it like, well, it's physics. You know, I can put you in a better place physiologically and I can put you in a better place mechanically. And it turns out that you will move faster through space. Right. But at the end of the day, um, and I trust me, I get guys coming to me that are big, that are skinny, that are fat, that, you know, and you try to address it. And they always ask me, well, what do you think? 
<laughs> it's always the, the question that once I start doing these assessments is, so what do you think? Do I have a chance to X or whatever? You know, they want to know if they, if they, if they're going to make the big game. Right. And I never know what to answer that with. I, I, I will maybe tell somebody, look, I'd like you to drop a little weight. I may need them to gain a little weight. I've got a guy I'm coaching right now in high rocks. He's turning into a really good runner, solid runner, uh, six foot four, almost, I think. Um, but he can't gain any weight. And he went to Chicago. By the way, I was in Chicago. You were? And, oh, awesome. Yeah, yeah, I was there. I was there with Sam and, and those guys. But um, anyway, uh, he's getting pounded in this, the heavy lifts, right? And he just doesn't have the strength to to push that sled as quickly as he wanted to, to carry the farmer carry or, or do the lunge walk as well as he'd like to because he just doesn't have enough muscle mass, right? And he's like, oh, man, I just got to. I said, we're going to go home and you can start throwing the groceries down, buddy. You're going to keep training. You just got to eat more because you're not eating enough, right? Uh, it's, it's no magic pill. It's like you just need to put on more mass as you train because you're doing the work. You just not do enough work to be anabolic. You're not you're not gaining muscle mass because you're probably catabolic 90% of the time. You're just not getting enough mass, enough food. Um, but the caveat to that is that he may end up having run um, – too heavy and he's sacrificing his run speed to gain the muscle mass right uh, so it's it's a tricky situation you gotta you, you know like for example uh like hunter hunter at 195 pounds is a weapon his speed running is good his strength is still really good if he sacrifices a little strength in order to gain speed in the run that's where he needs to be right if he tries going like 220 225 he slows down a little bit gains more muscle so you got to ask yourself, what's the equation? Do I need more strength? Do I need more speed? You know, so uh, I don't know if that answers the guy's it, question. It, but It does. And, and I had another yeah. example. Someone gave another very specific one before I lean into that. I think that's a lot of um, that experiment that I, I mentioned to you prior before I was kicking this off. The resistance training for endurance athletes. I, I'm very intrigued by the concept of performing 65, maybe 85% of your one rep max for higher time under tension. We're talking 10, 15 seconds per rep for high volume reps in which the main muscle fiber getting activated at that point is going to be your enduring type one muscle fibers. And you imagine someone going down into a squat in six seconds and then holding the bottom of a squat for six seconds and then having to explode up, you're still getting some contractile explosive creatine phosphate, you know, uh, the type one explosive muscle or type two muscle fiber exploding out of there. But the majority of your time there is spent under this tension where you're having to control. And what I've found is my heart rate, when I'm having to control these loads, especially as they get closer to 85%. And once you go above 85% of your 1RM, depending on what the movement is, it can get a little dicey. But you're, I mean, you, your, my heart rate is in, is is escalating faster than if I just did three reps, get down, use my stretch right. shortening cycle, right. bounce out of the hole. That's kind of scenario. And I've been experimenting with that, obviously, with me doing endurance training. Um, and I found it a to be structurally good from a res, you know injury resiliency standpoint. It's helping all my all the tough positions, right? You know, people who can't hold the dumbbell or barbell over their head for ten seconds, they probably have shitty range of motion at the shoulder, or some scap issues, a rotator cuff, or something going on here. Um, anyway, I just I, the side note as you were saying that, but there was an example here specifically given in a question that pings exactly where you are. This individual is ex essentially asking, what's the optimal ratio of power to weight? I need to hold 300 watts on my bike to go 20 miles per hour, and I'm sitting at 80 kilograms, eight, 176 pounds. Is it advantageous for me to get stronger, assuming I can hold the power, even though there will technically be more power needed because I'm slightly heavier at that frame? So how does one discover what that optimal ratio is? Is it just test and retest? Well, so the, the you know it's an interesting proposition because we're talking about a bike now, and the cool thing about a bike is that you got good reliance on power output because it's it's linear activity. You're not leaving the ground ever, right? With running, it's a problem. You can't really rely on power because the 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 force production is going all over the place, right? Um, but cyclists rely exclusively on power output. Almost, I said almost because in my world, I like to have guys compare their heart rate to their, their load, how much watts they're producing, right? Because let's just say, for example, you do a time trial at, uh, let's we'll do a time trial on the bike for say 10K 
at uh, what you believe to be your, your threshold, your lactate or anaerobic threshold. And let's just say during that effort, you hold uh, 250 watts, just throwing a number up there. And then you think, okay, that's my number, 250 watts. So you're trying to always push that 250 watts. Some days you're going to go out and do 250 watts and it's going to take you more cost of it, uh, work heart rate rate wise than it will on other days. So if you keep chasing 250, you might be um, over or under training, right? So I like to marry the both of the numbers together. So uh, then the, the question to better answer the question, if I could, is that the, the question might be, why are you not getting 300 watts? Is it because you're acidic? Is it because the lactate production is, is greater than your, your body can process, which is no longer a strength component? It could be just your the toxicity, the amount of lactate you're producing is beyond what you're able to produce more force, right? So um, would it be wise for him to do more strength training? I, I wouldn't say no. Um, but I wouldn't say that's exclusively the problem, right? It could be a lot of things and, and, it, and I'm trying to be a little less vague, but um, I, I'd have to look at it. But it, it, what's his history with strength training now? What is he doing now? So uh, he, he was my former videographer and a, and a coach of mine, a member. So he uh, mainly CrossFit for a while. Then he went the endurance route, but he's a taller kid. He, he's six foot one, two, whatever, de definitely an ectomorph and hard, a hard gainer by trade. Um, and he switched over into triathlons, endurance, running marathons, things like that. And now I think he's, you know, he's back into doing some CrossFit with his endurance stuff. And he, again, trying to uh, this hybrid concept, like, I think people love the idea of doing endurance. I think endurance is getting more of a badass angle to it. You've seen, uh, if you're familiar with Mark Bell, very famous yeah. power, Mark Bell's going to run the Boston Marathon, and he's one of—I mean, he holds still holds world records in powerlifting, and you've seen this like meathead marathon runner kind of like scene of these bigger guys getting into endurance, and that's going to link down to guys like I'm an ectomorph by trade. I'm generally would in, in high school is 148 pounds soaking wet. I have to work my ass off to keep muscle on my body, um, but he, I still I love the idea of being able to fuck around and go an hour and a half, three hours of, of work that, that, that appeals to me, but I still want to have the aesthetic of strength and, and of muscle course. and things like that. So I of think course. we're seeing a lot of this. Um, and I'm hoping, God, I hope some people listen to this. If you're a bigger guy and you're trying to get endurance, man, get with rich, get the Franklin. I'd love for rich to just one day. And I know you're done. I know you're not writing more. Well, you're working on a book. Every podcast I think I've listened to if you're like, fuck it. I'm not writing any more books. God, I hope one day you have like <laughs> the, meat, the, the meathead man marathon flow um for for the bigger guys um the you last know what? Before, go ahead can i just cut you off for a second i please, have something please that i wanted to share with you because based on what you've been telling me are you familiar with a guy by the name of ellington darden um uh doesn't ring a bell no doesn't ellington ring a bell. darden used to be like the spokes model for ymca okay he's got a phd in exercise phys but he's also like um, the poster boy for Nautilus. Remember when Nautilus? Oh was yeah, no, he was the first one to. Yes, no, he was the first one to prescribe tempo to to exercises. Yeah, so I've got his book, okay. which is called Super Slow, which yeah, is basically no, what you're yeah. talking about. Yes, okay, I know this now. Yeah. Yes, I have, yeah. I, I, I have, a, I have a PDF somewhere. I know that. Yeah. Um, it's actually yeah, what so, Coach Ian King out of Australia. It was the first guy he ever referenced of seeing someone apply what he called speed of movement to exercise right. prescriptions. Right. Oh, that's so, so cool. what you're describing to me with your tempo workouts sound very much like the way, uh, you know, they would do um, like maybe a two, four pace. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm basically doing a butterfly, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so come in hard, one, two, three, four, come in hard, one, two, uh, three, four. Yeah. I had a, my old partner when I was in the gym business, um, was I have to say he couldn't have been beyond five foot six tall, and the guy was a like a fire plug. He's just so muscular, and he his workouts would be he'd go around that Nautilus circuit we had, and he was done. He'd do that three times a week, and the guy was like a rock. And he did he didn't do he didn't even do any free weights. He he would just do you know the the traditional circuit of I think there's thirteen machines. Leg press, leg curl, leg extension, whatever. Boom, 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 boom. Yeah. Finish it, you're done. Everything was done on that tempo. And I mean, the, the, the guy was fit. 
it's incredible tempo. Everyone thinks about it. So ectomorphs like myself, we're kind of like a giant calf muscle. People have tried to grow their calves. The reason the calves are so hard to grow is because they're incredibly enduring. We walk around all the time on them. If you want your calves to grow, you've got to hit them with volume. When I would, because I've been a student of strength and conditioning since I was 15 years old, trying to make varsity lacrosse and get laid, right? And I'm trying to put on muscle. And so I would study like German volume training. And I would always do some kind of high volume training with my ectomorph clients as I came up as a personal trainer and strength and conditioning coach. And we always got great results with that because just ectomorphs just have that muscle fiber structure where they're just more enduring, which means you have to hit the shit out of them, heavy and enduring. Um, One more question here. This is – I actually have a a local running coach here uh, who I've been working with, and she's been doing the the running technique and stuff with me and and programming it and got me to my uh, 129 uh, half marathon pace. And she's been very interested. I've been sharing with her your work and we've been talking a lot about it. And when I asked her, she's a traditional endurance coach. So when I came there and said, Hey, I've got this crazy tempo training idea that I'm doing and I'm mixing and running with it. She took me on and I'm very grateful for that. But she, she had a question for the, for you. It was essentially how to help evolve a coach who comes from a strict endurance background, incorporate the flow method, not only in their own mindset shifts and perspective, right? Because they're coming from the old school way of thinking or a different way of thinking, but then, you know, in prescribing that in the physical training for the athletes, Uh, her name is Lisa Landrum. She's an an incredible woman, an awesome coach. And I I love that she even asked this question because so many, I think, endurance coaches are kind of stuck in their ways. They're very, they're never changing. Right. Well, so let me tell you something. I live in the world of pushback. Um, And, you know, whenever somebody discovers a new concept, uh, that's just part of the game. You're going to get some pushback. Now, I will, you know, I was going to say it early and I didn't. When you were showing the image of my flow cycle and the the affinity symbol, the affinity symbol, and I said this in the book, and just for the people that are listening, that's only to change your mindset. That isn't something you trace, right? So I, when I first revealed that concept, it was at a clinic, dry erase board. I got a magic marker out and I just started drawing this infinity symbol on the board. I didn't say anything to the people sitting there. They were looking at me like I was out of my, I think it was the guy finally lost his shit, right? He's, he's losing it, right? So I'm drawing this infinity symbol and I looked at everybody and said, what does that represent? And, you know, most everybody said, well, that's an infinity symbol. I said, there's no beginning, there's no end, right? So it doesn't make a difference whether you're going to go out for an hour run or a five-hour run or whatever it is you're doing. It represents a cycle that has no end. So if I I could have done a circle, but that just seems like I completed the circle, right? But most programming these days and in the past is linear thought processes. You're just following a, a plane, Start to finish, start to finish. Most races are are done that way. I guess I understand why. But what I wanted to do is just change people's mind. I wanted them to get off that. Now, I would take an A personality type and show them that that thing. And they're thinking, as a matter of fact, I had one person almost like a quarterback. They had on their forearm, you know, uh, a a plastic. The playbook, the playbook. Yeah, exactly. With two minutes here, two minutes there, four minutes there. I said, yeah. And they were so proud when they showed it to me. I said, you fucking missed it. (laughs) <laughs> you, you completely lost what I'm yeah. trying to teach you, man. And they were so they were so taken back because I, you know, I basically shit on them. And I, I wasn't trying to. I was just, I said, you're missing what I'm trying to tell you. I want you to touch these bases when your body says it's time to go. Go down, go up, whatever it is, stay in the middle. So this is difficult to impart to someone because they want structure. They want somebody to tell them exactly what to do. So, um. I think if I was to write it again, and who knows, I may end up doing that, I would cause it to be more universal. I, by the way, that's why I started putting scripts out there. I, I have a 20, uh, a marathon training program that tells you exactly what to do, right? And, you know, that really resonates with A personality types. I'm a B personality type. I don't like to be told what to do. I like to think outside the box. And this really works well for people once they gravitate towards it and understand it. They do it. And by the way, I am coaching people. I have the same problem as she has or potentially has is I have to teach people what I'm thinking. So then it comes down to trust, right? I know you. I, I know who you are. I love who you are. I trust who you are. You say, do this, I'll do it, right? 
And a lot of times people come to me, they come to me because they've heard of me or they, you know, I have, I have some street creds, right? So uh, if I tell them to do something, if I say, look, I want you to go bang your head on the, on the door, I'll be back in 15 minutes. A lot of these people, I'll come back and they'll be bloody and they'll be banging their head on the door when I get back because I told them to do it. So it just becomes a function of trust. And first of all, you got to believe it. And if you can't look at it, understand it, and believe it, then you have no, no, no prayer of teaching it, right? Um, so I don't know if that's answering your question, but no, I, and it does. It's funny as you were saying that I'm, I'm a B type in the sense that I don't like being told what to do. It's why I've, I've never had a boss in my life. Right. And I've, uh, I, I would be an HR nightmare. Um, and, but from a training perspective, I have found in my, this very brief, less than a year foray into endurance work and working with Lisa and, and following a program, you know, there's times where she's like, turn your watch on. Take off all G take off all the data so you can't see it, turn it inside your wrist, whatever. Because I'm someone who like I'm afraid that my own percept my my I'm afraid of being a bitch. I'm afraid I'm gonna go out there and I'm not gonna hit what I know I could hit because I have some kind of internal mental conversation that won't let me. I ran that half marathon and I was lucky that the half and the full marathoners go at the same time. Now I had my game plan, I had my paces, we had drilled all that, but you know, a talk with Lisa and I went and found the three hour marathon pacer because that's going to put me right there at my 130. And once I could see that guy there and I had one thing in my head, don't let him get away from you. Be on his ass. Know every freckle in the back of that guy's fucking neck. That's mm -hmm. your job. And if I give myself a task like that, there's nothing stopping me. Nothing stopping right. me. But when I'm left to my own devices, I guess maybe I have fear because hey, I'm not, I have zero uh, training age when it comes to endurance. I have an incredibly high training age and resistance training, but nothing there. Maybe I just, I have less confidence in myself and that will come in time. But uh, no, I, I can understand where you're coming from on that is, yeah, the coach has to be bought in. They have to truly believe in the science and be like, okay, this makes sense, which I find typically comes from either their own self-exploration into it or they get one of their guinea pig coach clients that'll do it. Like you said, do anything they say. Like, listen, I read this Rich Diaz guy's book. I'm not going to lie. I don't know if it's going to fucking work, but you'll do whatever I want you to do. So how about you? we try this out and you see the results? Because like you said, it's going to take someone, again, winning or doing well at the CrossFit Games, you know, and on the podium wearing a fucking Rich Diaz shirt with your thumbs up, having a scotch yeah. or something for people to be like, yeah. oh, I, I believe you now. I say that uh, with gym owners about – um the first person, like I, I went to an Olympic weightlifting clinic with Mike Bergner back in 2006. I had never seen a pair of wooden do wins, Olympic weightlifting shoes with the heel wedge. I had never seen that before. That was the first time I had ever seen it. And I, then I bought a pair of weightlifting shoes so I could have more dorsiflexion at the ankle and a more upright squat. And then my clients started buying them. And then their friends are like, you never do anything till you see one person with a proof of concept do well with the thing. And then you fuck Then you know, seeing is believing, unfortunately. And um, but yeah, I uh, I'm hopeful that from this conversation, someone's going to reach out to you and it, you I, I hope this kind of re sparks what I thought was a lot of momentum that you had with all the stuff you're doing with Fisher and all that um, pre COVID. I think a lot of coaches and gym owners were freaking the fuck out for two years. And, uh, you know, even if they like this idea, it sure as hell wasn't the time to be experimenting with it at the time. But yeah. I, I'm, I'm really, I'm very thankful for you taking the time today to come on and, and jam with me on it. this. It was fun. It was fun. Yeah. Absolutely. I always like to talk shop with people who like shop. Yeah, I, I absolutely, I absolutely love it. Um, so Rich, if anyone is interested, uh, the book, they want to learn more about the services and maybe come in to work with you in your lab and, 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 and Franklin, where, where should they go? Uh, obviously the best place is just go to the website and the website is Diaz, D I A Z human performance.com. And, uh, they're going to be surprised. I'm, I'm pretty receptive to conversation. Somebody reaches out, maybe they just got a question. I'm happy to, to, to engage with people. Uh, I'm very accessible. I mean, try to be the, the good news is I don't have a day job. This is what I do for a living. Right. And so um, I, I book appointments privately with people. I book appoint. I do the clinics. Got a clinic coming up here in in April. Um, that uh, I really love doing the clinics here because we cover all the base. During the clinics, we do a resting metabolic assessment. First of all, how much energy does your body require if you don't do a thing, right? And then we take from that the VO2, and the VO2 says, okay, if he runs for an hour at this heart rate, this is how many calories he's going to expend. You would be surprised how many people are undernourished that I deal with. I mean, completely undernourished and catabolic all the time. 
So let's just say that you're running with the devil and your heart rate or, or your or your caloric intake uh, is putting you in a place where your uh, your bob, body's going to gluconeogenesis. You're basically munching up muscle to create more sugar that you're absent, right? Uh, and then you, you you start to see you're, you're sore all the time. You start to notice that your performance is falling off and you, you get mad at yourself and you just start working harder, <laughs> right? So you dig a deeper hole. So I, I clear that up. You know, this is important. I clear that up. We look at the metabolic cost of work. We look at the way they're moving and we show them what they're doing wrong and we show them how to fix it. I get most people that are in front of me running better that day. And then the question is what they do when they get home. You know, they might run into their coach that doesn't like what I taught them and they just go back to doing what they were doing. Who knows? But uh, before they leave me, they get better. And we spend uh, it's be the better part of uh, three days just doing the work, just doing the work, doing the work. And uh, I mean, for the amount of time I put into these people, it's a sign. It's like, I think it's around 600 bucks or so to, to, to have that experience. Uh, I've been doing it for a little over 10 years all over the United States now. Where's and, the one uh, in April? What, uh, what's, what gym are you doing? It's going to be here. It's oh, going to be, be here 22nd, okay, 23rd, right here based out of my home. Very cool. Very cool. And I got, I'll go ahead. I'm going to put the website there in the, the show notes down there, guys. Um, and you guys will be able to access all of that. Rich, uh, thank you very, very much. Uh, once we get off this thing, I'd, I'd love to schedule some some time to come down and and see you even just privately as well on here. I'm, I'm intrigued by everything you're doing. And uh, I wish you nothing but uh, continued success. And I hope you keep... Um, I hope you keep disrupting and coming up with shit in which you get for further pushback on, because I, I think that's what's needed, man. Thank you so much, man. It's a pleasure. Absolutely.